everyone, and we are live. Welcome back to Prophecy 3 DNA, where we discover, decrypt, and demystify Bible prophecy, and then we apply it. My name is Donnie Alvarenga, and this is my brother, Don DeCuna, and we are honored to be your facilitators on the study of Bible prophecy. Over the past several weeks, we had been talking a little bit more about um, the old, the whole concept of a covenant, right? What was it? And, you know, what are the, how do we know it was a covenant? What are the parts of a covenant? What are the stipulations of the covenant? We talked about the old. As Christians, we know that we are under a new covenant. And so we have more recently started studying, okay, so what does that mean? And what are the, we're basically comparing and contrasting the old covenant to the new co covenant. And so the last time we met, we spoke about the one of the components of a covenant is the, what is it? The pr prologue? Preamble. 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 Yep. And um, we covered that part of it. And today we're going to keep going. So you want to kick us off with prayer, Don? Sure. I'll go ahead. Second. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us a, a new year, Lord. We started a new year uh, just today, Lord. We also want to thank you. Um, that we can have uh, liberty to just sit here and discuss these things without fear of persecution or retribution. Lord. Please be with us right now. Study your word. We can go and get a deeper understanding of what the new covenant means and specifically how, you know, what are the similarities and what are the differences from uh, the old covenant. In Jesus' most holy name, amen. amen. Okay. So, once again, we went over and we defined that a covenant, for it to be valid, it must contain these components. It must be structured or formatted in a specific way, okay? And last week, what we dis discussed was that the Old Covenant and the New Covenant have the identical format, same structure, right? Now, we start going in some of the similarities and differences. So, last week, when we talked about the preamble, Right. The original covenant was between God and Abraham's seed as in hereditary Israel. Right. And everybody prior to that. Right. Because we get people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that were a component of hereditary Israel. Right. Then we went into this week or we went into this covenant, how the concept of the preamble still exists. The only difference is that it's between Jesus and Abraham's seed. But Abraham's seed, based on uh, the faith of Abraham, vice, hereditary Abraham. Does that make sense? Okay. So it's still God. It's still Abraham's seed. But what those things mean are slightly different. Does that make sense? So the component of the preamble is there. So now what we're going to do is this week, we're going to talk about the prologue. Okay. And the prologue, just as a refresher, is the list of deeds already performed. That's the key word. Already performed by the sovereign on behalf of the vassal. Okay, so the so sovereign has already done some things. And now, if we want to remain in this covenant with the sovereign, we must submit to the sovereign's request. Okay, so let's go here. So again, the list of deeds already performed by the sovereign on behalf of the vassal. So going that the XY format that we had, the X being the sovereign, the Y being the vassal, we go back to the same concept. The sovereign is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Okay. What did he do? He redeemed or rescued us from slavery and bondage. But what is that slavery and bondage of? We were rescued and saved from sin and death. So let's see if Jesus did specifically this thing where he saved us or he freed us from slavery and bondage. Okay. So let's look at some of these texts. And the first one is in Luke 4, 16 through 21. Go ahead. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. When he had unrolled the scroll, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. I'm going to where? 21? Yep. 
Then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all those who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say them today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Okay. So I want you to focus on this word. What does that say? Because. Okay. So what is the word because? What is it necessary for? There's a cause and effect. A cause and effect. So Christ is saying, I have come for this effect. So let's read what some of these becauses are. Specifically, I want to focus on this. What does that say? Preach deliverance to the captives. And what else? Set at liberty those who are oppressed. To free those in bondage, oppression. And to set the captives free or slaves. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Freedom and deliverance, freedom and deliverance. For hereditary Israel, it was... Uh, slavery and bondage in Egypt. What we're going to understand here as we keep continue our Bible study is that it's slavery and bondage to sin and death. Okay? So let's keep reading. Go ahead and read this. 1 Corinthians 7, 22 to 23. For he who is called in the Lord, in the Lord while a servant is the Lord's freeman. For he who is called in the Lord while a servant is the Lord's freeman. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's servant. You were bought at a price. Do not be the servants of men. Okay. So when the Lord buys you, right? Because it says you were bought with a price. What does that mean? We've studied this and it's the concept of redemption, right? You were sold under slavery. You can only be freed with a cost. And that currency just happened to be Christ's blood. But because you were bought, you are Christ's servant. But how does Christ treat you? Does he treat you like a bond servant or does he treat you like a free man? Okay. You're muted. Sorry, free man. Okay. Here's, here's another two texts we're going to look at that has this idea of being purchased and what that means. First Corinthians 6 verse 20, you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And then here. First Peter 1, 18 through 19, for you know that you were not redeemed from your vain way of life inherited from your fathers with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So when Christ bought us, was it for him to be oppressive and subjugating us? No. No. He bought us to set us free. But with that freedom, now there is a choice that we must have. Right? Do we go back to being a slave and under slavery and bondage? Or do we remain free? Okay? Let's see what it means to remain free. But that we'll do that in continuing our study. So we were rescued, saved, redeemed from sin and death let's look at some I just of these wanted things to mention Go ahead. real quick that it's interesting that um you know we have a choice is it to remain free or return to bondage and it's interesting that the people of israel very often requested to go back to bondage <laughs> you know and we laugh but the truth we is do the same we do the same thing we do the same thing so let's let's read here about this the true freedom that christ is trying to give us from right that it's not an oppressive overlord of 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 an actual uh you know like like in Egypt for example does that make sense but an oppressive overlord that can keep us separated from him in perpetuity does that make sense all right so let's read here in Romans and see how Paul describes it do you, uh, Romans 6 16 to 23 do you not know that to whom you yield yourselves as slaves to obey you are slaves of the one whom you obey whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness but thanks be to God for you were slaves of sin but you have obeyed from the heart that that form of teaching to which you were entrusted and having been freed from sin you became the slaves of righteousness I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you have yielded your members as slaves to impurity and iniquity, leading to more iniquity, even so now yield your members as slaves to the righteousness and to holiness. For when you were the slaves of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit did you have then from the things of which you are now ashamed? The result of those things is death. But now having been freed from sin and having become slaves of God, you have fruit unto holiness. 
and the end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So we see these, these very big contrasting ideas that Paul's presenting here. Slavery to what? Sin. And we have been what now? Freed from sin. There's our slavery. What about our bondage? What does sin lead to? Death. But what is Christ's gift? Eternal life. So do we understand this contrast between Christ saved us from sin and captivity or bondage? Okay. Slavery to sin, bondage to death. Well, it's Eternal separation from him. Go ahead. In verse 18, it says, having, scroll back up again, please. Sure. So this is, um, verse 18 says, and having been freed from sin, you became the slaves of righteousness. So really we've become, and what does that mean? It's like you get to trade slavery to sin and death to slavery to righteousness and eternal life, right? That's, we get to choose. And when we talk about slavery, I think that a lot of times we think of it as, um, you know, like something that's imposed on us. But I think that what's even worse is what we do to ourselves. And it's kind of like, if you think, for example, of um, the concept of, of addiction, okay? You know, we might say something like, you know, I'm, I happen to be one that's addicted to food, right? So there's some people that are addicted to carbs, I mean, to, to alcohol. Some people are addicted to um, uh, drugs, right? And that addiction makes people feel like I want that thing. I want that thing. And we, we think, oh my goodness, woe is me because I can't have that thing. And actually what that means is that we become a slave. We no longer feel like we have a choice in it, although we claim that it's our choice to do it. Does this all make sense? I know that it feels like I'm going around in circles a little bit, but what ends up happening is that we unknowingly put ourselves in a situation where we surrender our, our choice because we're addicted to something. And um, what, what God is offering us is the freedom to choose, right? So that we can consciously choose and not be caught in a in a cycle of addiction a cycle of no no choice so there's a passage in deuteronomy where moses uh is speaking um from what god told him right and specifically what he says is i give you a road the road leads to life and blessings or curses and death it's your choice Okay, there's other places in scripture like Joshua and Elijah say kind of the same thing also. Serve God or serve your idols. There's no third way. Does that make sense? Because if you're not serving God, you're serving your idols. But if you are serving God, you can't possibly be serving your idols. They're mutually exclusive, right? That's why here it says you're free from sin but yet you're a slave to righteousness, right? Here's a key one. To whom you yield yourselves as slaves to obey, you are slaves of the one whom you obey. So you're always bound to someone. Does that make sense? It's your choice who you're bound to through the grace of God, okay? So let's just look at, um, this is going to be a long one, but let's do this. Let's just read, um, just read here, Romans 8, 1 through 4, okay? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. For, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and concerning sin, he condemned sin in, in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Okay, so here we need to understand if we're truly going to get what this whole rigmarole is between the law, we have to understand that there's two laws. 
Okay, what's this word here? From. 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 Again, words matter. So when we use the word from, what are we really trying to say? There's a contrast. One from, from another. So we're going to understand here that what Paul is describing is two different laws. Okay? Go ahead and read this one. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free. From what? The law of sin and death. Okay. So let's go back to Paul's very own writings. And what does it say here? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's one law that signifies the spirit and life in Christ. Okay? And if you're not abiding in this law, then you fall under another law that is a law of sin and death. Does that make sense? There are two laws. Some would argue that this is the moral law and the ceremonial law. When Christ came, how did he condemn sin in the flesh? How is sin now under condemnation? Well, he paid the price for sin. And so there he, he right? All sins fell on who? Him. Him. And then he died. So sins have now been condemned. But why is it that he was a valid sacrifice? We read this before. Because he was sinless. Because he was sinless. So there's one law that preaches that by the Spirit, because remember when we, when we first read the New Covenant, what were the components of the New Covenant? I will put my law where? On your, heart. on your heart. I will excise your stony heart and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my what in you? Spirit in you. And what is that spirit supposed to do? To keep my law. To keep my statutes. To keep my judgment. Does that make sense? At least that's what we get from this verse too, right? Is that the law of the spirit of life. Okay. So... It's very, very, very important for us to really, really understand what Paul is actually writing here. And he is clearly delineating two separate laws. The law of the spirit of life in Christ and the law of sin and death. Does that make sense? So as Paul's writing, and sometimes he makes reference to the law, which law? Does that make sense? Because he doesn't always distinguish which one he's talking about. But you have to understand that there's two. So you, by reading it, you can tell which context of which law is applicable. Does that make sense? So there's times, I'll give you an example in Paul's writing, where he talks about the law of circumcision. Okay. The law of circumcision, does that fall under God's moral law? No. Can women be circumcised? No. No. Right? But yet, Moses said everybody should be circumcised in their hearts. Does that make sense? But there was another law that you couldn't even participate in the ceremonies if you were not circumcised. So it falls under this criteria. So if we don't, when we read Paul's writings and we don't understand that he references two laws, but he never always distinguishes between them both, we have to get it by the context of what he's writing. Does that make sense? So sorry, I went off on a little tangent there. But basically, we can go back to one of the things that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, did was he redeemed us from the slavery and bondage to sin and death. Slavery and bondage. Sin and death. Okay? What's another thing he did? Okay? The Lord redeems us from the lands where he scattered us. Okay? And where is he gathering us to? That's something I want us to digest. 
one of the things Christ always said is the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here. And what he's really describing is this concept that we are all citizens of heaven, but we're not there yet. We can think in terms of like being an expatriate or an immigrant, right? A lot of, a lot of times the Hebrews were exiles. They were no longer allowed in their land, but they were a diaspora. They are now spread out throughout the world, but they are still always Jewish. Does that make sense? So he's redeeming us from the lands we we're, we're scattered from, but it doesn't mean that it is a land that we're all congregating to in a literal sense. Does that make sense? Okay. So we're going to look here in the, Old in the Old Testament and the New Testament where it describes what God does for us. All right? So here it is in Deuteronomy. The first one, Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 5. When all these things happen to you, the blessing and the curse, which I've set before you, and remember them among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, then you must return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I am commanding you today, you and your children with all your heart and with all your soul. Then the Lord your God will overturn your captivity and have compassion on you and will return and gather you from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you have driven out to the outmost parts of heaven, from there will the Lord God, your God gather you. And from there he will get you. The Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Okay, so when does this happen? When does when are we gathered together into one place? Obey his voice according to all that I am commanding you today. Okay. So when is does he gather us all? When we obey his commandments. Why is that the case? Because you only belong to a kingdom if you fall under the king's sovereignty. Does that make sense? So if you're not obeying the king's rules, you might be abiding in his kingdom. But guess what's going to happen once you're identified? You will be kicked out. Does that make sense? Okay, here's another one. Go ahead and read this. Jeremiah 31, 32. It will not be according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Because they broke my covenant, although I was a husband to them, says the Lord. So here is that contrasting opinion. When the covenant is broken, we are now exiled. We'll continue reading here in Jeremiah. 32 verse 37. See, I will gather them out of all countries wherever I have driven them in my anger and in my fury and in great wrath. And I will bring them again to this place and I will cause them to dwell safely. Here's another one. Jeremiah 32, 41, indeed, I will rejoice over them to do them good. And I will plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. And now in Ezekiel. Ezekiel eleven sixteen 16 through 17, therefore say, thus says the Lord God, although I have cast them far off among the nations, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet I will be a sanctuary to them for a little while in the countries where they have gone. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. Okay, and interestingly enough, he describes here how he will be the sanctuary for them. Okay? So what is he saying? Even though you're everywhere else, you fall under my protection. You fall under my sanctuary. What's a sanctuary? A place that's held for, for sacred purposes, right? And it's also like, like when people used to run, it was a place of escape. Does that make sense? Or a place of refuge where you can go to and now you're untouchable. Right? You run into a church or something as people are chasing you and you claim sanctuary. I'll even give you, when I was in the service, there is a, a, an amne or a sanctuary clause for, for a, a, a Navy vessel. Okay? For example, if you're in a country and then somebody comes running up the, the thing and claims sanctuary... We won't just kick them out. We have an inherent right to protect that individual because we don't know the reason why they came on board. Right? And maybe it might be a whole mob chasing. We're not going to just turn them over to the mob. Does that make sense? Okay? So what is God saying here? He is the sanctuary that has gathered us all. But we're gathered when we do what? 
We obey his voice according to everything that he was command. We were commanded. And the context of what he's saying is here, I am commanding you today. Let's see what that context is. Go ahead and read this. Where is this from? I just see chapter it, It's the same chapter. So Deuteronomy 30, just a couple of things over. Okay. Verse 8, you will return and obey the voice of the Lord and obey all his commandments, which I am commanding you today. Which commandments? The same ones that he said before. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it the ceremonial commandments or is it the moral commandments? The moral. Is it the law of the spirit of life in Christ or is it the law of sin and death? The spirit of life. Okay. Now let's see in the New Testament. Go ahead and read this. John eleven forty seven through 52. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees assembled the this, this Sanhedrin and said, what shall we do? This man is performing many signs. If we leave him alone like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, that the whole nation should not perish. He did not say this on his own authority, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but that he might also gather together in unity the children of God who were scattered abroad. So right here, it talks about how Caiaphas inadvertently proclaimed a prophecy. Which prophecy? The same one we read in Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Deuteronomy. And what is it? Who is this he? Jesus Christ, that he might also gather in unity the children of God who were scattered abroad. So is he literally taking all of them from each of these countries back to Jerusalem? Or is he putting them in his sanctuary? Paul describes this in the context of we are all the body of Christ. Peter describes us as living stones in a temple that is God. Does that make sense? So now we see that this has a spiritual application. Okay. Go ahead and read this. Hebrews 8 verse 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they did not continue in my covenant and I rejected them, says the Lord. And this is just a repetition of what was written in Jeremiah. Because when Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, okay. I'm not going to split hairs here, but the writer of Hebrews, when he restates the new covenant, he's restating Jeremiah. So nowhere in the New Testament is there an explicit writing of the new covenant except for in the book of Hebrews, which should already open our eyes when we say we're new covenant Christians, okay? Not understanding that it's not about you being a Christian, but it's about you being a member of Abraham's seed. Does that make sense? Okay. So, again, we are gathered together in unity, all the children of God who are scattered. Okay? So he redeems us from the lands that he scattered us into the kingdom of God. Okay? We are now citizens without... Uh, uh, with a true heavenly nation, but the United States where we live is not it. Let's put it that way. Next, what else did the sovereign do? The Lord cleanses us from our sins. So let me ask a question. If I go take a shower because I have mud on myself and I've, you know, all the water has cleansed me from my mud, and I walk outside the door, okay, am I now clean? Yes, I am now clean, right? I have mud on me, I go take a shower, and the mud is cleansed off of me. Now let me ask you a question. If I go in the shower and I get clean from my mud, and then I immediately go back outside and wallow in the mud, and then I stand outside the mud now, Am I now clean or am I now dirty? Dirty. Why am I now dirty? Because but, you went back into the mud. 
because I went back into what made me unclean. Does that make sense? Okay, now let's read these things again. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. Okay, so here it talks about how God is going to remove something. Remember, circumcise and excise are the same concept. Something's being removed. Next, go ahead and read this. Um, Isaiah 1, 16 through 18, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil from your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Okay, so now let's look at a, a, a thing here that Jesus Christ says, or that God says through Isaiah, okay? Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil from your deeds and cease to do evil. So what does it mean to be truly clean? To stop doing evil. The sin, who cleans you? Do you clean yourself or does God clean you? God cleans you. So do we go back and wallow in the mud or do we stay clean? Stay clean. What does cease mean? Stop. Conti perpetually, right? Seek. To cease. Okay? Here's another contrast that's given in the same verse. Your sins were scarlet, and they will be white as snow. Who makes them white as snow? Christ does. They were red like crimson, but they shall be as wool. In inference, here's that it's white wool. Right? So now you are clean. What happens if I now get scarlet back on me? You need to be cleaned again. You need to be cleaned again. Okay? So ultimately, what is God's entire goal? Right there in blue. That he really wants from us. Cease to do evil. This is linked specifically with what we've discussed many times here, which is re- Repentance, to turn around and now you're going in the right direction. If you're continually going in the right direction, you are not now getting dirty. Does that make sense? Okay, let's read here now in Jeremiah. 33 verse 8, I will cleanse them from all their iniquity whereby they have sinned against me and I will pardon all their iniquities whereby they have sinned and whereby they have trans transgressed against me. So who's doing this? The sovereign or the vassal? The cleansing? Yes. The, so the sovereign. The sovereign's cleansing. Let's see here in Ezekiel. Ezekiel eleven eighteen. When they come there, they shall take away all the detestable things and all the abominations from it. So what does it mean to be truly cleansed? To... The detestable things and the abominations will no longer reside there. Does that make sense? Okay. Here's another one in, in Ezekiel. And oh, by the way, all these here, with the exception of Isaiah, these are all new covenants, just in the Old Testament. So go ahead and read this uh, in Ezekiel. 36 verse 25, then I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. So if God cleanses us from our filthiness and our idols, what happens if we return to our filthiness and our idols? Basically, it's not a one saved, always saved philosophy. Okay, basically, if you take a shower today, you might need to take a shower tomorrow if you get yourself dirty again. Right? Yes. Let's read here now in the New Testament. Okay. Hebrews so 9, 11 through 15. But Christ, when he came as a high priest of the good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a, hef ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify so that the I'm lost here for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer 
sprinkling the unclean sanctifies so that the flesh is purified. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience, conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, since a death has occurred for the redemption of the sins that were committed under the first covenant, so that those who are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And what is one of the components of that inheritance? To cleanse your conscience from dead works. Okay. So, specifically here, it's even alluding to, it says it here specifically, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant since he died. And well, as we read, remember, there's a sacrifice that's a component of the covenant, right? So, what is God trying to do? Cleanse our conscience from dead works, or other where, otherwise, works that lead to death. Does that make sense? Okay, here's another one. Hebrews 9, 21 through 23, likewise, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of worship with blood. And according to the law, almost everything must be cleansed with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was therefore necessary that the replicas of heavenly things be cleansed with these sacrifices, but that the heavenly things themselves be cleansed with the better sacrifices than these. So Christ is cleansing us with what? His blood. Blood. Mm -hmm. So am I saying that um, we can do this of our own accord. What is the name of the moral law in accordance with what Paul wrote? The law of the spirit and life of Christ. So how can we stay clean? Because Christ cleanses us with our blood. And so now we don't do these things for fear of the bad things. We do these things because we are grateful for the blood. Does that make sense? Keeping the commandments can never save you. Keeping the commandments are a fruit of salvation. Does that make sense? For the sheer gratitude that my God died for my sins. So the least I can do now is, you know, be grateful that he did that and not, there's even verse in Hebrews, it talks about you don't, not crucifying God again. Does that make sense? All right. Go ahead and read this. First Peter 1, 18 through 19, for you know that you were not redeemed from your vain way of life inherited from your fathers with perish perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb with, without blemish and without spot. So if we continue in our vain way of life, have we accepted the redemption or have we rejected the redemption? We rejected it. What else have we rejected? The precious blood. Go ahead and read this here. And this is talking, now this is Revelation talking about in the future. Okay? Revelation who are these point? people? Hold on. Who are these people? Okay? That are clean. Who God Revelation. has cleaned. Go ahead and read it. I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Revelation 7, 14. I said to him, sir, you... You know, he said to me, these are those who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Okay. So who are these people? Go ahead and read that. Um, Revelation 12, 11, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Okay. They were, their robes were washed in white with the blood of the lamb. Here also now in Revelation 12, it talks about they overcame, and this him, oh, by the way, is the dragon or the devil, okay? They overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. We're going to do an entire study in just Revelation 12. And, and obviously, we're going to do the whole thing in Revelation as well. But a key, 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 key component here, okay? Actually, I'm going to put up one more text. And it's in Revelation 14. That aligns almost perfectly with that verse right there. Go 
Go ahead and read this. Uh, it's Revelation 14, verses 12 through 13. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they, that they may rest from their labors, for their works follow them. Now let's read here this again. Revelation 12, verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Unto Do you the see death. the similarities here? Mm -hmm. There are those that are going to do two things. Keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Word of their testimony, blood of the Lamb. Jesus, the word of God. These people are being blessed if they die from here on out. These people could care less if they die now. They love not their lives unto death. It's like, you can take my life but I refuse to betray my sovereign. Does that make sense? So, the Lord cleanses us from our sins. He doesn't cleanse us in our sins. God isn't standing there with a fire hose while we're wallowing in the mud, spraying us with a water hose. Does that make sense? When God washes us, he takes us and he hoses us off and he says, go and wallow in the mud no more. Going back to uh, uh, John, you know, uh, in, in the book of John, where, where Christ is, is interacting with the, the, the lady that got caught in adultery. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. When he's interacting with Cain. In Genesis 4, you must overcome this. Does that make sense? So what we need to decide is what is greater, our sin or our God? Can God enable us to defeat that sin? Yes, he can. And it's hard to do because we forget about God. But I would, I would um, wager that if we always remembered God in those moments and we prayed for his, you know, his willpower, his strength, we won't sin. We will endure that temptation because Christ endured those temptations. Does that make sense? All right. The Lord will enable us to keep his commandments through the Holy Spirit, not of our own devices but through his spirit and his spirit alone. Okay? So let's see in the Old Testament if this is the case. Go ahead and read this in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 30, verse 8, you will return and obey the voice of the Lord and obey all his commandments, which I am commanding you today. Go ahead. 30, verse 10, if you obey the voice of the Lord your God by keeping his commandments and his, his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, and if you return to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So when are you cleansed? What's that word? If. What about here? If. If you obey and if you return. Mm -hmm. Obey what? His commandments and statutes. Which ones? The spirit of life in Christ. Okay. How are you supposed to do it? with all your heart and all your soul. Other places in the Bible are going to describe what this means. Let's look at this in, in Jeremiah, because this is the new covenant in Jeremiah. So go ahead and read this. Jeremiah 31, 33 to 34. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for... for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, said the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. Here's the key. Go ahead and read that. I will put my law within them and write it in their heart. This is the identical verbatim passage that's in Hebrews. Okay? I will put my law in your heart. Can you be a new covenant Christian? Can you be a new covenant seed of Abraham 
without having God's law on your heart? No. Let's read this now later on in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 32, 39 through 41. And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their good, for their good and for their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts so that they shall not depart from me. Indeed, I will rejoice over them to do them good. And I will plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. So you know what this word fear means? Respect reverentially obey reverentially submit okay and when we have that heart that god gives us we will reverentially submit to him for how long forever an everlasting covenant once again i will put my fear right here my fear in their hearts so that they do not depart from me. So once again, if we are not in a covenantal relationship where we keep the stipulations, what have we done to Christ? We go back in the mud. We go back in the mud and we separate ourselves from the covenant. Remember, we have to remove, extract ourselves from the covenant. The covenant is always there to bring us in. Does that make sense? Once we were out of good standing with the covenant, can we fall back in good standing? Yes, through God's grace. And once we're in there, what does he do? He puts his fear in us. Reverentially obey. Now in Ezekiel, go ahead and read this. Ezekiel eleven nineteen 19 through 20. I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them. And I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. So what happens when we have this heart transplant? We become transformed. We basically follow. follow Reverentially submit to what? God's statutes and ordinances and do them. This isn't a passive acceptance. This is an active thing. You can't just keep the commandments. You can't just lock yourself in a closet and say, I'm keeping his commandments. It's a, a practical thing. It's an action. It's a do thing. Go ahead and read this one, Ezekiel, again. Ezekiel 36, 26 through 28. Also, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will keep my judgments and do them. You will dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. And you will be my people and I will be your God. So once God's spirit is in us, what does God's spirit enable us to do? Walk in his statutes and obey him pretty much. And his judgments and do them. Once again, an active thing. Do them. My statutes, my ordinances, do them. My statutes, my judgments, and do them. Go ahead and read this. Then you shall remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your own your iniquities and your abominations. So what's the true test that the Spirit is in us? Basically, we feel... We, we bear the guilt, like we feel terrible about what we've done. To who? To the, the blood of the lamb, to Jesus. To God. Why did I put him on that cross? I will do everything in my power and God willing with his spirit to never once again be injurious to my God. That's why in when we read here in Revelation, it talks about at the end time. There are those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. The blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Why? Because I would rather die than hurt God again. Does that make sense? Okay. You, we are so mad at ourselves for how we hurt God. And understanding that the, the, the Ten Commandments have two components. God and each other. 
because it hurts God when we hurt each other. So now, not only do we loathe ourselves for hurting God, we hurt ourselves for hurting other people. Does that make sense? Okay. So he enables us to keep his commandments to the Holy Spirit. That was in the Old Testament. Let's look at the New. Okay. Does this also apply to the New? Go ahead and read this. 2 Corinthians 3, 3 through 6. For you are prominently declared to be the letter of Christ, prepared by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on human tablets of the heart. We have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to take credit for anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us able ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Okay. So once again, there's this talk of the spirit of the living God, not tablets of stone, but on human tablets of the heart. I will remove the stony heart and I will give you a heart of flesh, human tablets of the heart. And then can we take credit for this? No. It says not no. that we are sufficient in, our, in ourselves to take credit for anything. Nope. Read this in Corinthians. Second Corinthians 3, 15 through 17. But even to this day, when Moses is read, the veil is in their hearts. Nevertheless, when anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Okay. So once again here. When we read the commandments of our own fruition, our own volition, what, what, what remains on us? When we try to keep the commandments of our own desires to do so, what happens? Well, it says the veil is in their hearts, but I'm not quite sure connecting that with what you're saying. So basically what happens is this. Does God want an open veil or does God want a closed veil when it comes to what, what we have inside of us and our hearts? What is the veil? Okay, so the context of what's being described here is, is basically like a covering. Okay, like your heart is being covered. Um, the real true context is this describes when Moses came down from the mountain. Uh, at one point, his face glowed, like had a real big glow on it. And so what did they do? They put a veil over his face because it was too bright and it hurt their eyes. Okay. Who gave Moses that glow? God did. He was so empowered with the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit was shining through him. Do you think God wants the Holy Spirit to shine through us? Or do you think that we want to put veils over our eyes so it doesn't hurt us so much? He wants to shine. Okay. So what is happening with God's law? Can we look at God's law and it be offensive to us and therefore we have to cover it up? Or do we want to reflect God's law to everyone around us? Well, we, we've studied before that, you know, God's law is a reflection of his character. And so ultimately what we're saying is that we want to reflect his character. And the way that we do that is by reflecting his law. And right here. So if we look at the law and it hurts our eyes so much that we want to cover it up. Or let's say this, we only want to cover up nine of the ten. Does that make sense? Well, I'm cool with these, but this one here I have an issue with. God says, if you break one, you break them all. all. Right? So if we look at it and it bothers us, that means there's still a veil over our hearts because we can't really look at it. But when we turn to the Lord, the veil is removed. And now it's shining through. Now the Lord is the spirit and the spirit of the Lord where, I'm sorry, where there is the spirit of the Lord, there is liberty. So when Christ said, I came to set you free, what does he mean by that? James even describes the law of liberty. You're only truly free when you keep the law. Because when you're not keeping the law, you're working. Does that make sense? You know how hard it is to cover up a theft? You know how hard it is to cover up adultery? You know how hard it is to cover up a lie? Does that make sense? Now, if you don't lie, 
You have nothing to be ashamed of. If you don't murder, you have nothing to be ashamed of. Does that make sense? And then we'll read here uh, in Hebrews. Hebrews 8, 10 through 11. This is the covenant that I will make with the, with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest. All right, so where did this come from? Hebrews and Isaiah, okay? And also this part is Jeremiah. Um... Now we'll read this. Just read this last part of Hebrews. Go ahead and read this. Hebrews 12, 25 through 29. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who spoke on earth, much less shall we escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has given us a promise saying, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also heaven. And this statement, yet once more, signifies the removal of those things that can be shaken, things that are created so that only those things that cannot be shaken will remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be moved, let us be gracious by, by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. So right here, in the context of, of him who is speaking, this is the Holy Spirit. So what is, what is, at the very end, the writer of Paul saying? See that you don't refuse... The surgery. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, if you refuse the surgery, you still have the cancer. Does that make sense? Yes. Conversely, you can have, like, you were talking about food addiction. You can have, you know, gastric bypass surgery, right? And for a while, you're eating different foods in a different diet and you're going to lose weight. But what happens to your body, even though you've had the surgery, if you go back to eating as poorly as you did before? Do you think that surgery is going to matter? Nope. Okay. Don't refuse the heart surgeon. Okay. Don't refuse the Holy Spirit. And here's the last one and then we'll be finished. The Lord forgives our sins. Okay? So, what has he done? We have now sinned against God. So he says, I forgive you. Go and sin no more. Okay? So let's look in the Old Testament and then the New and then we'll close it out. Isaiah 43, 24 to 26. You have brought, bought me no sweet you have bought me no sweet cane with money, nor have you filled me with the fat of your sacrifices, but you have made me burdened with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins, but put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. State your cause that you may be justified. Okay, so who is the one that forgives our transgressions? God. God does. But if we continue sitting, what are we doing? Well, bugging him with our sins we are it's not just bugging it weighs god down you burden me with your sins you have wearied me with your iniquities we're basically doing the reverse to god putting trying to put slavery and bondage on god by constantly hurting him does that make sense go ahead and read this in jeremiah 31 34 they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the lord for they shall all for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and we re will remember their sin no more. And we'll just read, this will be the last one. Jeremiah 33, verse 8. I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against me. Okay. So, in the Old Covenant, God says, I, with my mighty hand have rescued you from slavery and bondage in Egypt. Then he gives them the commandments. Does that make sense? He saves first. Then he, in, he invites us to keep the commandments.
So there's an interplay here in a sequential series. You can't keep the commandments to be saved. You must first be saved to actually keep the commandments. Okay. So what is it that the, 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 the sovereign did for us? He redeemed us from the lands where he scattered us. He, slaved, he saved us from slavery and bondage to sin and death. He cleanses us from our sins. He enables us to keep his commandments through the Spirit. And he forgives our sins. So does this fill the criteria of the prologue? And it's all in the new covenant. Okay? The sovereign has already done this on our behalf. So what did you learn from today's, today's um, lecture or whatever this thing is? Well, it just... Just a review of what it is that God has already done for us. You know, I think that when, like you said, we're the the old covenant was kind of literal, if you will. It was literal Israel, you know, biologic Israel. It was literal Egypt, <laughs> literal slavery, and He used that as a living parable, if you will, for the New Testament, which was spiritual which is the spiritual um, Israel and the spiritual slavery and the, the, the spiritual redemption, right? Um, and so it's, they're the same, except that one was literal and one is spiritual. And it, it like broadened it. Bottom line is that he has done all the work. He has done all the work. And so therefore he has earned the right to request loyalty so going back to your concept of literal versus now symbolic okay there was a literal temple with a literal ark with a literal stone law written with god's finger what is god trying to do now symbolic temple symbolic ark his law Written, but not on stone, but on the heart. The same law, new location. Not a new law. Same law. Why do we know specifically that it's the same law? Because every reference to the new covenant is in the Old Testament. And every, every time it's describing the law, it's describing the law of the spirit of life in Christ. Does that make sense? So here's one last thing I want us to take when we close this out. When did Jesus do these things? And this is in Romans 5, 6 through 8. While we were yet weak, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Rarely for a righteous man will one die... Yet perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Go back to the Old Testament. While the Hebrews were yet slaves in Egypt, Christ rescued them with his outstretched arm. Does that make sense? All right. Can you pray to close us out, please? Yes. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for everything that you have done for us. Honestly, you have done it all. You have done it all. And all we need to do is accept and then just stand in awe and in loyalty out of sheer love and appreciation for all you have done. And Lord, we want to, we want to be loyal to you and we want to demonstrate our gratitude and praise you forever. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.